When I was at school, some of my teachers used an overhead projector for lessons, but you don't see them around very often anymore. In fact, I was pretty surprised that they are still available to buy in some places. They were already going out of fashion when I saw them back then, and they're quite a rarity now. But it's pretty cool how it works, there's a very bright bulb down in the base, which reflects light out onto the surface. And then these light rays are focused through a lens onto this mirror and then reflected onto the wall behind me. And I can share any information I want on here by writing on these sort of plastic transparencies. Now I'm talking softly in this video because I want this video to fall into the category of ASMR. Now this is a genre of video that's becoming quite popular and if you haven't already encountered ASMR videos, well they have a few intended purposes. One is to help people relax, another is to help people sleep, and everyone needs sleep and relaxation at times so maybe that's why you can understand it's quite popular. There's another thing that can happen with ASMR, often when you're listening with headphones in, it can give you this slightly tingly feeling in the back of your brain, um, and so that's why people like it too. Often these ASMR videos are really softly whispered, but I'm doing mine more soft-spoken. One of the reasons for that is this projector makes quite a lot of noise. There's a fan in the bottom to keep everything cool, and I'm worried that if I whispered too softly that perhaps you wouldn't be able to hear me very well over the sound of the overhead projector. I would like to quickly thank Fabulous for sponsoring this video. Fabulous is a pretty fitting sponsor for this video because they also place a lot of importance on relaxation, mindfulness and self-improvement. Fabulous is the number one self-care app to help you build better habits and achieve your goals. I think all of us have experience with setting New Year's resolutions that get abandoned pretty quickly, but the best way to actually achieve your resolutions is to break them down into tiny habits, and the Fabulous app can help you stick to them. It was developed by behavioral scientists at Duke University and contains guided journeys to help you achieve your goals. I've been using it to try and set up a morning routine that gives me a bit of momentum for the rest of the day, which I find can make all the difference. There's no shortcut to changing habits, but Fabulous offers a sustainable long-term approach to change your life by building on small successes. To start building your ideal daily routine, you can click on my link in the description and the first 100 people to do so will get 25% off a Fabulous subscription. So thank you to Fabulous and let's get on with the math. I have a plan for today to show you some math questions using the overhead projector and for it to be a relatively relaxing sort of math lesson or overview. For some of you, math might induce a lot of anxiety, but hopefully this can be a way to boost your confidence or interest just a little bit in, you know, quite a relaxing setting. I've got exam questions from Brazil, Turkey, Australia, India, the UK, and the USA. And this video is going to be the opposite of a speed run. I'm going to be going through the problems quite slowly and in a way that I can talk about some of the fundamental ideas involved in the questions so that even if these things are quite unfamiliar to you or it's been a while since you did questions like these, that you'll be able to follow along what's happening and what some of those fundamental ideas are behind it. A reason that I've picked exam questions to go through is for me personally, I've always learned quite a lot from watching problems get solved. Compared to, you know, just reading about the fundamental ideas, seeing them actually in action and used in a problem helps me understand their context a lot better. Our first stop is Turkey. This is a question from the 2021 AYT exam. And like many of the questions that I've chosen for this video, it's for kind of an end of high school level or people wanting to gain entrance into university. 
Now, I had this question was translated and the wording was quite long, but essentially it said that we've got two photographs of the sunset. Now in photograph one, the sun appears as a semicircle. This is the ocean down here, the sun, and then the clouds. Now, the distance from the top of the sun to the waterline is 3.9 centimeters as measured on the photograph. Then, after some undefined time later, we have picture number two, and the sun has sunk a little bit down over the horizon, and now the distance from the top of the sun to the water is only 0.3 centimeters as measured on here. Now what we want to find is this question mark, this mystery distance in here, which is how wide the sun appears in our second photo. A key word from the question is that this first image of the sun is a semicircle, and a semicircle is always exactly half of a circle, so that vertical distance that we're given is indeed the radius. So let's draw our own semicircle. On here we can mark what we know. If the sun initially looks like this, then after some time we just see the top of it. The distance in here was that given by 0.3 and this total distance we knew was 3.9 which means that if we take 0.3 off that the rest is 3.6. Our mystery distance is this line all the way across here but since we've cut it in half if the whole thing were to be called x, this here would just be x over 2. And we can actually draw a right angle triangle right in here. Since it's a semicircle and this distance was the radius, this line here is also the radius of the circle. So it is also 3.9. And with that, we have a right angle triangle where we know the value of two of the sides and we're trying to find the third side. For that, we're able to use the Pythagoras theorem. If this is our right angle triangle and one of the shorter sides is A, the other shorter side is B, and the hypotenuse is C, then the Pythagoras theorem says that A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. For us, A is 3.6, our B is x over 2, and our C is 3.9. These decimal numbers are a little bit messy, but it's not impossible to calculate these squares. Remember, you don't have a calculator for this question. We could go over to the margins and write 3.6 times 3.6. We could do 6 times 6 is 36, carry the 3. 3 times 6 is 18, 19, 20, 21. Add a 0 here. Go on to the next line, 3, 6 is our 18 carry the 1, 3 threes are 9, plus the 1 is 10, add these up, we'll get 6, 9, 2, 1, two digits past the decimal place in here, so our decimal point will go between the 2 and the 9, and the answer to that would be 12.96. Again, in our little margin, we could do the same to find 3.9 squared. We'd go 3.9 times 3.9. 9. 9 times 9 is 81, 3 times 9 is 27, plus 8 will give us 35. Do our next line, 3 times 9 is 27, 3 times 3 is 9, 10, 11. This one will add to give us Fifteen point two one. So we've got twelve point nine six plus x over two squared is equal to fifteen point two one. X over two squared is equal to subtract the twelve point nine from both sides. mentally find the difference between these two numbers, I'd say, well, this is only 
0 0.04 away from 13 and then 13 is 12.21 away from this so in total the difference would be 2.25 x over 2 squared is the same as x squared over 4 times both sides by 4 to get rid of this we have x squared is equal to 9 and thankfully 9 is a pretty easy number to take the square root of so I'm going to go with x is equal to 3 centimeters and so 3 will be the answer to this length in here now I'm sorry to say but we actually did it the slightly tedious way. There was something that we could have noticed which would have made these calculations redundant and the algebra a little bit easier. Perhaps. Depending on how familiar you are with Pythagorean triples. Pythagorean triples are known sets of numbers that satisfy this a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The smallest one is 3, 4, and 5. Let's take a look at a little bit of a visual proof of that. If I had a right angle triangle where one side is of length 3 and the other side is of length 4, then the length of the remaining longest side will be 5 squares. With the way that the light is projected up onto my wall, things up here look a little bit larger than things down here. But believe me, I've tried to make all these individual squares the same size. Each of these objects represents the side length squared. So 3 squared is this square that's 1, 2, 3 by 1, 2, 3, a total of 9 little squares. 4 squared is 16, so there'll be 16 little squares here. And 5 squared is 25. Pythagoras' theorem is saying that the size of this should be the same as the sizes of these two added together. Here's our 5 squared, and I'm going to go at it with my scissors. From this, I can cut out a 4x4 four four grid. Now I've got the 4x4, four four, but let's see if this little remaining bit can be made into a 3x3. Three three. And there we go, we can see our 4 squared and our 3 squared popping out of that 5 squared with nothing left over. The next smallest Pythagorean triple is actually 5, 12 and 13. So when we were back at this stage there is a chance that we could have noticed that 36 is 3 times 12 and so 3.6 is 3 times 1.2. And 3.9 is 3 times 1.3. So following our Pythagorean triple, x over 2 would have to be equal to 0 0.5 times 3. That's 1.5. So x would be equal to, well, multiply by 2, that's 3 centimeters. A faster way to get the same solution that we had before. I don't know if you'll agree that it simplifies the math by much, but people have been using Pythagorean triples to simplify their working for literally thousands of years. We've seen Pythagorean triples used on the world's oldest example of applied geometry on a 3,700 year old Babylonian clay tablet, which laid out the division of land and boundaries of a field and use Pythagorean triples like 5, 12, and 13 a thousand years before Pythagoras himself was even born. 
So Pythagoras wasn't the first person to invent this or to find these triples, but the theorem still holds his name. Our next stop is Australia. Now this is an exam question from what is called the HSC advanced paper, and that is something that would be sat by high school students in the Australian state of New South Wales. The question says, calculate the sum of the arithmetic series 4 plus 10 plus 16 plus dot 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 plus 1354. An arithmetic sequence is a sequence of numbers in which there is a constant difference between each term. So you're adding a constant amount every time. An arithmetic series is what it's called when you add all of these terms together. In general, if we call the first term of our sequence A, then our second term would be A plus D, where D is our difference. In this one up here, it looks like D would be equal to 6. You've added 6 here, and then again here, and so on. The third term of our sequence would be A plus 2D. Then all the way up to our last term, which would be A plus, well, how many times have we added D? If this is the nth term at the end, and we started adding D from the second term onwards, then we would have added D n minus 1 times. If you already know the formula to find the sum of any arithmetic series, then you might be able to look at this and plug it straight into that formula. But we're actually going to derive it, so how do you add up one of these things? Well, let's call the sum of our general series here, s of n. We're going to add up each term, starting with a, then a plus d, then a plus 2d, all the way to adding a plus n minus 1d. Now what we can do is write out the series again, but this time in reverse. We start with our last term, a plus n minus 1d, and then our second to last term, which would be a plus n minus 2d then a plus n minus 3d, and finishing with our first term, a. You often see mathematicians try this technique where they write out the series again but backwards. That's because it allows them to do some kind of cool tricks. One is to add these two series together. We add s of n to itself. Doing that, we would get two s of n's. The first term of that would be a plus a plus n minus 1d. Well, what is that? a plus a is 2a plus n minus 1d. The next term is a plus d plus a plus n minus 2d. And that might look pretty different, but actually what do we have? An a here and an a here, 2a plus, well we have n minus 2d, plus an extra d, that's actually n minus 1d. And in fact, every term in here gives you that same result. I'm going to run out of room on my transparency, but a plus 2d plus a plus n minus 3d is also equal to 2a plus n minus 1d, and you can see it pretty obviously with our last term too. So in total we have that 2 times s of n is equal to this term 2a plus n minus 1d repeated for however many terms we have. So repeated n times. To get rid of the 2 and get us the expression just for one series, we can do n over 2. And we can simplify it just a little bit more. If we look back to our sequence, the last term is always a plus n minus 1d, and we kind of see most of that in here, although we have an extra a, and well, a is always the first term, so this can also be written as n over 2, a, which is the first term, plus the last term, maybe we can call that l. 
Now that is the derivation of what will always be the sum of an arithmetic series. So let's get to working out our problem. We have what we've derived just here, and we know that, well, there's a constant difference of 6 between each of our terms, so d for us is going to be equal to 6. Our very first term, a, is equal to 4, and our very last term, L is equal to 1354. We don't, however, know our value of n. They haven't told us how many terms there are, so we can't jump straight into using this one. Instead, let's put what we know into this formula here for our last term. If 1354 is equal to 4 plus n minus 1 times 6, then subtracting the 4 and dividing by 6, we have 1350 divided by 6 is equal to n minus 1. That will be 225. I think you might be allowed a calculator for this exam. This is the Australian one. Is equal to n minus 1. And so n is 1 plus this. n is equal to 226. Now we have n and all that we need to calculate the sum, so s of n is equal to 226 over 2, first term plus the last term. Well, if we plug all this into the calculator, we end up with 1, 5, 3, 4, 5, 4 as our answer. Well, who would have guessed? That's what it is, adding up all that. This question reminds me of a little story that goes around about the mathematician Carl Gauss. He's known as perhaps one of the greatest mathematicians, and this is a story from the time when he was at school. Apparently Gauss's teacher wanted a bit of peace and quiet, so he asked the class to add up all the numbers between 1 and 100. As the other students set about adding it all up very slowly and carefully, Gauss almost immediately wrote down the correct answer, which was 5050. Gauss could perhaps see a formula similar to this one, and applied it to the problem. He said to have imagined it as folding up these numbers in half, and then adding up the pairs such as 1 and 100, and 2 and 99. That would be 50 pairs of 101, giving the answer. Or expressed as a formula, the first and last term times n divided by 2. Now this anecdote tends to make the other students in the class sound pretty unintelligent, as if they would add up 1 plus 2 plus 3 and do every single step in order. But I challenge you to imagine doing this for yourself, even if you knew nothing about math or sequences and series and these formulas and tricks. As you go through the numbers, you can't help but see some patterns. In fact, it almost seems difficult to do it in the hardest way. Maybe you'd see that in adding up the numbers between 10 and 19, you'd get the same sum as adding up the numbers lower than that, just with an extra 10 sets of 10. So just because you're not Gauss answering it in a few seconds doesn't mean there aren't lots of ways to solve a problem like this. This next question is from India. Now, often when I've spoken about Indian exams on my channel before, I've spoken about things like the JEE, which is a super specialized engineering focused, really difficult paper for university entrance. But this question here is from the CBSE exams, and in fact the standard mathematics exam for grade 10. Now this isn't even the most advanced paper, we could have gone to grade 11 or 12, but I found that picking the grade 10 one brought it a little bit more in line with some of the other problems I've picked, and made it a little bit easier, you know, for this video where I don't want to stress you out too much. Um, so the, these CBSE exam papers from India are more standard, sort of given to everyone, rather than just those people who want to specialise in engineering. Um, so let's have a look at the problem. It says, the value of k for which the system of equations x plus y minus 4 equals 0, and 2x plus ky equals 3 has no solution, is what? Right. 
Equations like these represent straight lines, and when we're talking about solutions of systems of equations like this, we can imagine where the straight lines might intersect. So if we have an xy axis like this, then in the case where, for example, one line might go like this, the other might go like this, we have one place where the lines intersect, and that would represent one solution. We also refer to this situation as being consistent. Let's try another possibility. If we have one line, and then another line exactly over the top of it, so that you can barely even tell them apart, well, we're going to have infinite solutions. Because since these lines are perfectly over the top of each other, there are infinitely many places where they meet. The situation is also referred to as consistent. And there's one last possibility to consider. And that is in the case where our two lines, one here and one here, are parallel to each other. They're like train tracks, perfectly parallel, and they're never getting closer or further away. They're always staying the same distance apart. In this case, there will be no solutions. The situation is referred to as inconsistent. So in our question, we're asked where these two straight lines have no solution. So really we're asked how we can ensure that these lines will be parallel. We often see straight lines written in this format, y equals mx plus c. This is the slope intercept format. And here, m represents the slope of the line, and c represents the y-intercept, so where it cuts the y-axis. For two lines to be parallel, they would differ only in the y-intercept, so they would have the same gradient, but just shifted up or down by some different amount, c. If c was the same and the gradient was the same, well, they'd be on top of each other. So one way to solve this is to rearrange both these equations into this form and see what you can do to make sure that m is the same for both lines, but that c is different. But this is a question on an Indian exam, and they love to find tricks where you can solve these questions almost instantly. Sometimes that involves memorizing a lot of seemingly random little formulas and equations to solve these quickly. And maybe in the extreme time pressure of exams like this, maybe even rearranging it into this form is way too slow. So let's see where a shortcut might come from. In general, for simultaneous equations in this form, ax plus by is equal to c, often we can solve the equation by adding these two together, and hopefully in a way that cancels out one of our variables. For example, if a1 was 1 and a2 was minus 1, then adding these two together would remove the variable x, and you would be able to solve for y. If a1 and a2, or b1 and b2, aren't already the same magnitude, we can multiply them by some constant to make sure that they are. We just have to make sure to multiply every term by that same constant. For us, our equations can be written as x plus y is equal to 4, and 2x plus ky is equal to 3. If we multiply the entire top equation by minus 2, then adding these together, we would see the x variables disappear. We would have minus 2x minus 2y is equal to minus 8. That's all fine, because we did it to every single term, so it's the same equation. Adding these up, we have 0x, then k minus 2y, being equal to minus 5. 
Now we don't know what K is, but that's the thing we're trying to find. Let's have a think about it. If k was any value except for 2, this would look like a normal equation. We'd have something times y is equal to minus 5. We could find that y is equal to minus 5 divided by whatever this value is. That would represent a consistent set of equations, one where there is one solution. But what if it gets weird? What if k is equal to 2? We'd have 2 minus 2, that's 0. 0 times y is still 0, and we would end up with 0 is equal to minus 5. That is if k is equal to 2. Now, believe it or not, this is actually what we want. Seeing something like 0 is equal to minus 5, well, that is inconsistent. There is no solution to this because, well, think of it like this. What values of x and y result in 0 being equal to minus 5? Well, none. There are no values of x and y that ever make this true. This is inconsistent in the truest sense of the word. So the answer to the problem is actually k is equal to 2. And if you're an Indian student studying for an exam, you probably already know a shortcut way to think about this. It is to say that for no solutions, we want to ensure that the ratio A1 over A2, that's these values here, we want to ensure that is equal to the ratio of B1 over B2. Basically means that when you decide to multiply it by that constant, minus 2, that we cancel both our x's and our y's, because these ratios are equal to each other but we do not want both of those to be equal to the ratio of the constants C1 over C2. That is the shortcut way to find the answer to this problem. So if they had have also been equal to C1 over C2, well, in that case, the constants would have also cancelled out, and we would have been left with 0 is equal to 0. That doesn't represent no solutions. In fact, this is always true. 0 is always equal to 0. So if this is the ratio between all the coefficients, you actually get infinite solutions. Now, I also had questions prepared here from the UK's GCSE and from the American SAT exams, but I'm looking at my camera. It's been filming for a long time. Looking at my mic, it's about to run out of batteries, and I'm starting to feel like maybe I've done enough already, so perhaps I'll save those extra two questions for a part two, or if anyone enjoyed this video or made it to the end, let me know and I'll know to keep them for later. Thanks so much for watching this video. I know it's been a little bit different. It's been a little bit of a risk for me to do. If you've been listening to Try and Fall Asleep, then good night. And if you've been watching to relax or unwind, I hope that the rest of your day is positive and not too stressful, that you get some good stuff done. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters for making my videos possible. And a special shout out to today's Patreon Cats of the Day, who are very astronomically named Pan and Tilt.